William Gregg, it's so, uh, such a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you for, for joining me. You're the author of a guide on liberty.me on, um, on how the police are not your friends and how we need to begin to treat them as, our actual, as an actual threat to our liberty. Um, you saw a lot of this coming uh, some years ago. So you're widely regarded in the uh, liberty-minded community as something of a prophet. Yeah, well, that's very flattering. And unfortunately, there's a sense of dreadful vindication in that. And I really do appreciate your kindness, Jeffrey. It's a subject that's very unpleasant and becoming increasingly unpleasant as the contrast and antagonism between the police and the public grow more intense and acute. I'm one of many people uh, my age, a little younger, who can remember when the police weren't quite as ill-disposed toward the public as they are now. And like many other people my age or thereabouts, at one point I considered becoming a police officer, becoming a police detective, and I actually studied in college with that objective in mind. And as a journalist at The New American, I was on very congenial terms with the police, and I actually attended a specialized training session in Chicago, the University of Illinois Chicago on counterterrorism with a group of law enforcement officers and got a certificate in counterterrorism. It was about that time, 1996, 1997 or so, that the cultural change, I thought, became really palpable in law enforcement, where the orientation had been shifted almost entirely in the direction of the central government at the expense of local affinities, and they were becoming more overtly militarized and assuming a mindset much more compatible with that of an army of occupation than that of civilian peace officers. It was obvious at that time that we were headed for some real trouble. That was less than 20 years ago. What year was this? 1997. What, what year was this? 1997, you said? 1997, yes. Right. That was so I have a, my, own recollection, my own recollection of... My own recollection of this period was that things began to change after the uh, Oklahoma uh, City bombing. Um, is yeah. that is that your sense too? Actually, I think they started to change around 1994 with the omnibus crime bill that had been passed in the first couple of years of the Clinton administration, and that included a couple of initiatives in the general direction of civilian disarmament or what they call gun control. And that happened in the year prior to Oklahoma City, and some people saw Oklahoma City as a reaction to that. I don't think that's entirely accurate. I think Oklahoma City was precipitated with the help of our good friends and three-letter three -letter federal agencies are always going out and creating <clears throat> these homeland security operations, as we now call them. But in 1993, you had Waco, and just a few months earlier, you had Ruby Ridge. And then in 1994, you had the Omnibus Crime Bill. And all three of these developments either displayed the federalization of law enforcement and the militarization thereof, or amplified it. And beginning in 1994, it became very overtly obvious to people that the federal government uh, intended to take over the residual local control of law enforcement. And in 1995, you had uh, Janet Reno of uh, Waco Infamy introducing the Law Enforcement Support Organization, LESO, which is the conduit being used now to send all this military hardware to local police. That all was an outgrowth of another initiative called the War on Drugs, which started in 1971. So this is something that's been gestating for quite a while. And then the beast was delivered perhaps sometime in the late 1990s, and it's come to awful maturity now, uh, about 12, 13 years after September 11th. So that's where we are right now, and it's an ominous place to be. And and we're experiencing a lot of blowback. I mean. Um, yeah. I know myself. I, you know, I when when I even when I'm stopped for something just silly like running a stop sign, stop sign, or getting a speeding ticket or something like that, I, I feel an intense uh, sense that I'm about to be captured. And yeah, essentially, it's part of our nature as as human beings to to want to resist that. <laughs> and that nature, of course, has been criminalized because all human beings have an instinctive aversion to captivity and to right. being placed under the immediate control of another human being. That's something against which we rebel. We're designed that way. And that impulse is something that police are taught to perceive as a threat to their safety, and officer safety is the highest and holiest consideration for them at all times and in all places. And they always talk about the dangers inherent in a traffic stop for the police officer, but statistically and in practical terms, you're at far greater risk as a so-called civilian than you would be as a police officer. 
And your instinct, Jeffrey, is entirely a healthy one, and it's one I hope would cultivate, because we should understand that these armed strangers who accost us when we're in automobiles or on the street, they're clothed in a claim of what they call qualified immunity that allows them not only to initiate force against us, but to escalate it until we submit to them or to kill us if we refuse to yield. And they understand this. This is something that's very much part, a part of their indoctrination. But the public has not really come to understand that until recently in large measure because of the ubiquity of cell phones and other video recorders. We now have access to these incidents where police live down to our lowest expectations. And I want that to become the new normal, that perception of the police to become the new normal as a survival strategy for the public. It's a terrible thing to say, but it's a ter more terrible thing to ignore that reality. Yeah, and it's it's an overwhelming sense you have. It's it's a, a sense of of threat, and I, I I I I've always been puzzled about this a little bit. How it is that fleeing the police is considered to be you know the greatest, I mean maybe the stupidest thing you ever do, but it doesn't strike me as the most immoral thing you'll ever do. Yeah, I agree, and it's also assumed that if you're resisting arrest, you're committing a crime. If you're a criminal, that is to say, you're somebody who's injure the property rights of another human being, then you're expected to flee. I mean, you're not expected to submit to capture and punishment. If you've not done any harm to anybody else, why shouldn't you resist? But one of the most common forms of summary street justice, that's the expression used by a lot of police officers to describe their behavior, is handed out in punishment for the act of resisting arrest. And resistance can be simply a, a momentary fleeting impulse of non-cooperation. If you blade your body, that is to say, put one foot behind the other, if you assume a fighting stance, which means that you do something that rec that constitutes a change of posture toward this uh, person who's accosted you, that's considered a form of aggression by the police. And most of the videos that we see on YouTube and other file sharing sites that involve police brutality always involve a police officer, usually several of them, screaming, stop resisting, stop resisting to people who are doing nothing more than trying to avoid getting hurt. And that is something that's an anomaly really in, in Anglo-Saxon history as recently as the 1940s it was understood that you had a right to resist an unlawful arrest. Here in the state of Idaho until 1969 it was understood that you had a right to resist unlawful arrest. There are legal decisions going back to the late 17th century in England that recognize not only a right to resistance but also a moral duty to come to the aid of somebody who's being beaten or otherwise abused by the police. There is a Supreme Court or Supreme Court ruling, rather, from the year 1900 called Bad Elk versus the United States that recognizes that right as well. But as a matter of policy, that's been changed. It's not been changed legislatively for the most part. It's been changed administratively, and now we're at a point where if you do something that in any way discomfits the ambition of the uniformed stranger who's making himself your temporary owner, then you've done something that is supposedly worthy of summary punishment up to and including execution. I'm a big fan of the of the series by P.G. Woodhouse, uh, Jeeves and Wooster. You know, am I? Uh, yeah. uh, written in the interwar period, and uh, so part of the ongoing fun of of that of that uh, series is that people are constantly fleeing uh, arrest. Uh, yes. Yeah, they they that's it's it's a game to steal uh, the, uh, steal steal the helmets of of, of the police. <laughs> You know, uh, when, they, when they try to get you, you would never just submit. You run the other way. If you can trip them, you know, coming out of an alleyway, that's great. If you can lead them into a lake and they fall in, that's all the better. This is just part of the uh, uh, the action of of normal civilian life, and it's and it's all fun. But the fun is just gone now. We can't even imagine that world. No, it's as foreign to us as. Uh the world's described in the Barsoom series, perhaps. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock series. And Sherlock, of course, this is not well understood. He was a private peace officer. He was a private investigator, a consulting detective. And he worked with Scotland Yard, but his relationship with Scotland Yard was one of rivalry that wasn't particularly congenial because he was always showing them up because he was more efficient, more observant. He had gifts that they did not have at their fingertips. They were commissioned by the government to solve crimes and he was always beating them because he was somebody who did this as a, as a vocation rather than as a government sinecure, a government calling. And 
you see a similar attitude in the Sherlock Holmes books, I think, to that described in the interwar period. Sherlock Holmes, of course, of course is late 19th century. Uh, Jeeves and Wooster was post-World War One, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, 1920s. 1920s. Yeah. yeah. And there was already a, a change happening in the law enforcement culture in Great Britain at the time. It was a matter of some controversy when Peel proposed the creation of the Metropolitan Police in the second, third decade of the 19th century because there was still this vestigial resistance on the part of the British public to the idea of militarizing society. And that's what they saw this proposal doing. It was something that was to be imported to the the main British society from their colonial outpost there in Ireland and the Royal Constabulary of Ireland that had been an occupation force for a colonized society was the model for the Met and for the subsequent police departments that developed in England and a lot of conservatives rejected this they didn't think that it was a good idea to have these people in military uniforms running around the streets of London uh, ordering people around and they made their peace with that unfortunately by the middle of the 19th century and that's when the United States imported that model and so it was always baked into the cake of the institution that you would have the militarization of society to one extent or another. And it's just so refreshing to say, Jeffrey, to read these books by Wodehouse in the beginning of uh, the 20th century and see that there was still this somewhat, uh, I don't think that adolescent is the right term, I'd say this, this uh, vibrant, uh, vigorous rejection of the idea that we needed nursemaids, armed nursemaids. And they were not armed in the same sense the police are now, almost a century later. I mean, I don't think that uh, Peel would recognize uh, the people who were uh, swanning about in body armor and carrying high-caliber weaponry as the outgrowth of the, the model that he proposed uh, a couple of centuries ago, but uh, they are unmistakably the, the descendants of that institution. They are his genetic legacy, if you will, in an institutional sense. You're watching uh, the news you, you, you see and commenting on various incidents of, of cop shootings and that sort of thing that are happening and, you know, combined with police abuse and all the rest of it. And it's, it's very disturbing uh, where, we're, where we're going. We know the cause of it. Um, what, is your, what is your sense? What is your expectation here? Uh, uh, the more militarized the police become, the more uh, these conflicts are going to do, sort of persist? Or do you think that... Uh, there's a chance that we can uh, sort of dial back uh, the increasing conflicts. Well, my hopes on that front all have to do with sort of the late Soviet Union model of institutional implosion when they could no longer bear the costs of maintaining their garrisons in Central and Eastern Europe, and they simply withdrew. And I think that at some point uh, we will see the positive element of an economic collapse in this country, which is that the central government's no longer going to be able to keep the Praetorians on the payroll. And what's happened over the last 20 or 30 years is that all these local law enforcement offices, uh, all agencies, whether you're talking about sheriff's departments or police departments, they become affiliates of the central government. This is part of sort of a vertically integrated structure where they see themselves as beholden to the people who provide them with subsidies and with uh, toys that are often very expensive from the Pentagon and specialized training and all of this. All this costs a great deal of money, and one of the things about empires is they eventually collapse under the weight of their own economic absurdity, and that's going to happen here, and when that happens, you'll have that element taken off the table. But there's a really unsettling coefficient to that, and that is the, the war on drugs, which is the longest-running war in the history of the regime that rules us. It's been going on uh, fits and starts one form or another for about a century now with alcohol prohibition and narcotics prohibition. But what happens with the war on drugs is that the local police not only become formally militarized, but they're set forth as sent forth as bug, uh, as uh, bummers <clears throat> to collect and and subsist upon what they steal from the population through asset forfeiture, and that's a huge element of what's driving the antagonism between the police and the public is that the, the police, whenever they stop you in a car, Jeffrey, they're looking to build the stop. Build the stop is one of the admonitions you read in the training materials. That means that you try to work from a stop, a traffic stop, to the point of what they call reasonable suspicion and then probable cause. If they have reasonable suspicion, they can ask you to search a car. If you have probable cause, they can claim the right to search a car. And if they find anything in your car of value that can be in a conceptual sense connected to the drug trafficking problem, then they can confiscate it and hold it, whether you're talking about money or cash, or money or jewelry or or credit cards in some instances, or the automobile itself. And if you take a look at the budget of your local police, your state police, 
if there are people who are getting a burn grant from the Justice Department, that's BYRNE, a burn memorial grant, uh, then they'll have a, a narcotics task force, the, the whole purpose of which is to conduct asset forfeiture. And that's one of the ways that they support themselves, they materially support the police, is through asset forfeiture. And that means they confiscate it, they hold the property guilty of, a, of involvement in a crime, they put, they put the burden on you to prove that the property itself wasn't involved in a crime, and then usually they'll just, they'll just take it and keep it. Uh, there was a case in Nevada recently where a young man had uh, several tens of thousands of dollars of cash on his on his person, and it was money he was going to use to set himself up in a business, and he had won it from uh, Las Vegas and in, in uh, the casinos there. And the officer said, "Well, I'm taking that. I, I get to keep that now, and uh, you can't do anything about it. I don't have to prove you did anything wrong. This is all caught. This is all caught on camera, and this is all very typical. And I think what's going to happen is that you're going to see." less direct subsidy from Washington of police and uh, sheriff's offices and more of this type of activity and it's going to heighten the antagonism between the police and the public and so the police are going to grow increasingly tribal their sense of uh, encirclement and their sense of siege is going to become exacerbated and so I think we're actually going to have an escalation in violence on the part of the police here because they realize that they've sort of lost the mandate of heaven and the public no longer believes that they're the the fair and perfect knights of legend. They see them now as, as government officials who are interested in, in plundering them. And so in the near term, I think we're going to see an escalation in antagonism and hostility and most likely violence. What happened in Las Vegas last weekend is certainly not going to help when you have two police officers who are doing no harm to anybody who were murdered at a pizza joint. One of them shot in the back of the head. And that police officer, Alan Beck, is the relative of mine by marriage. He's actually the second cousin to my wife, Corinne. And this is the sort of thing that will help exacerbate, help inflate the sense of, mm. see, of see, being besieged by, uh, by the police. And the Metro Police Department there in Vegas is a horrible, horrible police department. I mean, they've been murdering and mutilating people for 20 or 30 years now. They have an inquest system that always validates the actions of police, no, no matter how morally objectionable or illegal. And... So they're already predisposed toward the abuse of force, and now in the wake of this horrible and completely unjusti unjustified act of murder here, uh, this is something that's going to be an even bigger problem to the public. And so I don't think things are going to get better in the near term, but in the intermediate term, perhaps, after we're dealing here with the end of the illusion that the government can continue indefinitely funding all this activity, uh, there might be some institutional changes because there are going to be a bigger problem locally, but that means they might be more accountable locally because they're not going to be backstopped by the feds so much. At least that's what I'm hoping. I don't know for sure, but I, I do have some guarded optimism, albeit ironic optimism on that front. Do you see any evidence that this has become a, a political issue at all? I, I haven't seen it. Oh, I think the political class is always the last to pick up on social trends. Mm -hmm. um, what's happened in the public realm, of course, because of YouTube, because of a number of activist groups that are involved in this, is a police, or forgive me, the public understands this, and it's becoming more and more commonly a topic of conversation, and it's sort of bleeding into some of the supposedly respectable organs of mass indoctrination. The New York Times had a pretty good piece just a few days ago talking about the militarization of law enforcement with these Pentagon yeah. grants, or less so and so forth. So now it's become a, a common topic of conversation, which means that uh, at some point, presumably, some elements of the political class are going to tumble to the reality here that the public is really worried about what's happening. But I think that what's likely to happen on that front once again is that the the main players are going to reassert their their little domains. The the police unions, for instance, are are incredibly powerful yeah. at uh, the local level and state level. Uh, they're still a formidable obstacle to overcome. And even in California, you have Jerry Brown, uh, the much uh, noted Governor Moonbeam, who's very much in the pocket of the police guards union, the, the uh, so-called correctional officers union. And uh, so they can really sort of distort the, the political and, and policy dialogue in ways that we can't uh, perhaps appreciate until we actually watch it real time unfold. But I'm, I'm confident that in this realm, as in so many others, that the public's well ahead of where the political class is right now. And so I think that uh, through withdrawing consent and through the much disparaged but very effective medium of education we can actually bring about a change in how the public interacts with the police and yeah. the policy actually follow. That's very important for people to realize that we're everyone is just one step away. You think you're free but you're one step away from being from being caged. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. killed. 
or killed. And at, yeah, maybe the best possible outcome is being caged and having all your property stolen. But if you if you resist even more, you can be you can be killed. Uh, and just, there there are ways to overcome this. I uh, at least be be prepared for it in any case and be aware of what's going on. I would encourage everybody to go to liberty.me, download your guide, read it. I just reread it this morning. I, th I think it's very powerful and extremely informative. So I wanted to thank you for for writing that. And um, we also have another guide by Justin Hanners on, on Liberty.me, which you know, deals with some very practical issues. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. Um, Glad but, study, yeah. He did some good work. Really yeah. good work. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you so much, William, for all your amazing work in this area. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. Take care. Bye-bye. ...officers and got a certificate in counterterrorism. It was about that time, 1996, 1997 or so, that the cultural change, I thought, became really palpable in law enforcement, where the orientation had been shifted almost entirely in the direction of the central government at the expense of local affinities, and they were becoming more overtly militarized and assuming a mindset much more compatible with that of an army of occupation than that of, you remember, when the police weren't quite as ill-disposed toward the public as they are now. And like many other people my age or thereabouts, at one point I considered becoming a police officer, becoming a police detective, and I actually studied in college with that objective in mind. And as a journalist at the New American, I was on very congenial terms with the police, and I actually attended a specialized training session in Chicago, the University of Illinois Chicago, on counterterrorism with a group of law enforcement. The uh, liberty-minded community is something of a prophet. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's very flattering, and unfortunately, there's a sense of dreadful vindication in that, and I really do appreciate your kindness, Jeffrey. It's a subject that's very unpleasant and becoming increasingly unpleasant as the contrast and antagonism between the police and the public grow more intense and acute. I'm one of many people uh, my age, a little younger, who can... William Gregg, it's so, uh, such a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you for, for joining me. You're the author of a guide on liberty.me on, um, on how the police are not your friends and how we need to begin to treat them as, our actual, as an actual threat to our liberty. Um, you saw a lot of this coming uh, some years ago. So you're widely regarded in the civilian peace officers. It was obvious at that time that we were headed for some real trouble. That was less than 20 years ago. What year was this? 1997. What, what year was this? 1997, you said? 1997, yes. Right. That was so I have a, my, own recollection, my, own recollection of, my own recollection of this period was that things began to change